Alrighty, we're one minute after the hour. We have a very full session ahead of us, so I'll get started. Uh, hello, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in Canada. My name is Rachel Braun from the University of Calgary, and it is my pleasure to start us off of the first of four sessions of the Siegel Canada Research Series. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which I am meeting with you today is the traditional territory of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Susina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders, past and present. I also acknowledge that as we come together today, while staying apart, we may be gathering on other traditional lands around the world. I acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge, laws, and philosophies of the Indigenous people with whom which we all share these lands today. With me today are my co-organizers from Seawell Canada's Research Committee, Dr. Andrea Sater of Simon Fraser University, Shay Ipkovic of the University of Waterloo, and Sean Elliott of Wilfrid Laurier University. And a warm welcome to everyone that's joining us today. As we start our session, I encourage everyone on the call to share their name and institution in the chat. You're also very welcome to include your own land acknowledgement, and it would be great to know which of our colleagues have joined us today. A few notes about the Zoom platform. We have Seawill tech support on standby if any issues do, do come up. But if you have something unexpected that happens during the session, your best bet is to leave a call and join again. But if the issue persists, please notify us in the chat and we'd be happy to help you. In between each presentation, we also hope to have time for a few brief questions. Um, to do so, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. It's in the black bar. If you submit them there and address your question, I can moderate the questions in between and keep us on time, but also engaging in some really interesting discussion. Over the coming weeks, the Seawell Research Series will feature eight research papers published in the practice of co-op and work integrated learning in the Canadian context. This book brings together a collection of research on the practice of cooperative education and will in the Canadian context. This book is meant to inspire researchers and practitioners alike working in this field day to day to apply research to their own practice, as well as to invite the will community at large to ask more questions and further propel will research across Canada. It's also available for download on the CEO website, and I'll post the link to that in the chat. Let's kick off the Seawell Canada Research Series with a few words on advancing well research from Dr. Ashley Surley, who joins us from the University of Toronto and is also the chair of Seawell Canada's Research Committee today. Over to you, Ashley. Thanks, Rachel, and welcome everybody to the first session of our 2022 Seawell Research Series. So it's my honor and privilege to be the chair of the Seawell Research Committee. Um, and I thought maybe I would just start off this session by talking a little bit about what is the role of the committee and how we got, got to this point. So uh, the role of the research committee is fairly simple. Um, over the last several years, we've been working to address two main objectives. Uh, the first is to encourage, um, highlight the value of research and encourage more individuals across Canada to get into research on co education and work integrated learning. And secondly, we want to find a way to highlight the great research that is already happening across the country in this area. So last year was the first year that we launched a research seminar series um, as an opportunity to again highlight some of the great research that is occurring and use it as a platform, again, to hopefully inspire some of you to start asking questions in your own work and maybe start dipping your toe in the research realm yourselves. Um, but this is actually a very exciting year, um, is our second year. Um, I will say that when we started off last year, I personally would have been pleased to have a group of 20 <laughs> um, gathering online talking about research. Uh, we had a great turnout last year, and this year I've been told that we have over 120 um, registered across the webinar series, which is fantastic. It's so exciting to see not just the growth of this field, but the growth of the community of practitioners and scholars that are interested in the field of research and work integrated learning, and it's just exciting to see where we go, go from here. 
Um, hope to see in future years all of you presenting as a part of this, this seminar series. Uh, the other thing that makes this year particularly exciting is it's an opportunity to highlight uh, our recently released book on the practice of co-op and worker integrated learning in the Canadian context. So again, one of the initiatives of the research committee as recommended by um, longstanding members of CWIL and of that committee, we wanted to find a way to again, highlight the great work and research that's happening across Canada. There's amazing work that's happening in research across the globe. Um, we, many of us follow scholars from Australia, New Zealand, uh, various uh, spots in Eurasia, and uh, but there's also great work uh, happening in Canada and thought this, we need to get the Canadians on the global landscape and uh, get them the international attention that they, that they deserve. So this led to the development of the special um, issue, Canadian issue of the International Journal of Work Integrated Learning. Um, and very excitingly led to the uh, development and publication of the first book in Canada on, again, co-op education and work integrated learning in the Canadian context. So this is a really exciting opportunity for us to highlight the research that has been published in this book, um, and importantly, the authors uh, from across the country. So what you're going to see across this webinar series, you're going to see research that has been conducted uh, across the country, across university, college contexts. Uh, you, we are going to hear research that has been done on the purpose and value of work integrated learning, how to delineate and define different types of work integrated learning based off of purpose-based typologies. We're going to hear about research that's been done on the value and outcomes of work integrated learning for professional development, for learning, for employability, um, and many more positive benefits and outcomes, uh, as well as some of the barriers to achieving these. Uh, we're also going to hear about critiques of work integrated learning and experiences across diverse disciplines, mining, medical industry, uh, across public health as just some examples. Uh, and also, uh, there'll be some presentations specifically focused on alternative um, non-co-op forms of work integrated learning, specifically community engaged learning, which is really exciting as CWIL itself has recently broadened its mandate to include the diverse ways in which students may engage uh, in, in learning um, with the community and workplace more broadly. So um, one thing that I want to um, uh, do is I want to um, make sure that we remember that the purpose of this is not necessarily to uh, to prescribe to, okay, this is the exact finding, this is exactly what I must do, do um, in, in my program, but rather I hope that as you are listening to the presentations, you do ask questions. You might get an idea that you think, oh, wow, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that, and I could absolutely apply that to my practice, or, oh, interesting. I actually think that we've had a different experience in our program, and maybe that's something that I could look into and do more research on, on myself. We're going to end the research seminar series with a presentation by uh, Dr. Judine Preddy, uh, who is currently the head of the research committee for the World Association of Co-op Education. She's also the incoming president of CWIL and co-editor on this book. And so really looking forward to her presentation um, at the end of the seminar series and how to get into research. So how to get started for those of you that want to get into this, uh, may not know where to begin, or for those of you that are already doing research and wanna get more involved, uh, she will be wrapping up with some great tips uh, to get started. So before turning it back, um, I want to extend my thanks. I wanna extend my thanks first and foremost to everyone who contributed to the development of this um, ebook. So to the authors, to the reviewers, uh, to the CWIL Research Committee members, to everyone who, from the initiation and conception of this idea, uh, through every part of making this become a reality and um, its promotion at this point in time, thank you very much. It wouldn't be possible without you. This is really exciting, again, to showcase the great work that's happening across Canada. Um, and I hope that there's more initiatives to come. Um, and then very importantly, I really want to give a special shout out to the CWIL Research Committee members who have really taken on the organization of this seminar series. So special thanks to Andrea Sater, to Shay Ivankovic, to Sean Elliott, and to Rachel, Rachel Braun. Uh, this wouldn't have come together without you. Thanks for your leadership and for making this happen. 
So without further ado, I will turn it back to Rachel to get started with the research presentations. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Ashley. So our first paper is presented by Apira Raghunathan on Obedima Ezekia, both of the University of Toronto Scarborough. Their paper is entitled, Work Integrated Learning Experience for Public Health Students, a case study project in partnership with a community farm. Over to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen because I do have a PowerPoint. So give me a few seconds for that. Can you guys see that? Oh, yes. There you go, okay. Um, awesome, okay. Um, so hello everyone. Thank you for having me present at this research series um, for the paper, a case study project in partnership with a community farm. Um, I'll just start off with a little introduction. So my name is Apira. I'm currently a student at the Dalai Lana School of Public Health, specializing in the health promotion stream. I received my bachelor's degree from the University of Toronto in Health Studies and International Development. And during my time there, I worked with the Global Health and Innovations Lab under the supervision of Professor Opidima Azazika, who is my co-author on this paper. The chapter in the ebook I am presenting to presenting today is based off my experience as a community engagement coordinator for Professor Azizika's Global Health and Human Biology class. So I'll start with a little background information on the course as well as the project itself. So the Global Health and Human Biology course is designed for students to apply their knowledge of human biology to solve real, health, real world health cases. So some of the learning outcomes of the course include understanding the dynamic relationship between biological issues and global health, identifying strategies used to prevent or treat diseases in successful global health projects, executing problem solving steps appropriate to completing a variety of global health case study assignments, and working with a team to complete specific group projects related to global health and human biology. The final culminating evaluation in the course is a group project in which students develop an intervention, such as a program or policy to address an emerging global health issue. These interventions are usually hypothetically developed and based on information learned in class. In 2020, however, students were given the opportunity to participate in a work integrated learning experience in which they worked with a local organization to address food insecurity in Toronto, as well as present their intervention ideas to the community partner. So who was involved? We had our community partner, of course, who was Black Creek Community Farm. They are a nonprofit in the Jane and Finch neighborhood in West Toronto. And their goal is to address food insecurity by increasing access to healthy foods. They do this through several of their community programs, educational workshops, community gardens, and food distribution projects. For our participants, we had 13 students interested in being part of the WIL experience, who worked in two groups to develop policies and programs to address food insecurity in Jane and Finch, as well as prevents, present their novel ideas to their director of Black Creek Farm. So for this presentation, I just wanna highlight the five lessons we learned from coordinating this project, as well as its relation to the club's experiential learning model. And towards the end, I'll also highlight some of the guidelines we developed of how to improve future WIL experiences for public health students. So just a very brief overview of what the model is. Kolb's experiential learning model is a four stage learning cycle that describes how we learn using experiential learning opportunities. The four stages are the concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, and active experimentation. So for the first stage, students participated in many different concrete experiences to boost their learning involvement in the project. This included visiting the community forum to meet with the director where they learned firsthand how the Jane and Finch community is affected by food insecurity. They also got a tour of the farm to see all the resources in place to address food insecurity, such as greenhouses to grow produce all year for their distribution projects, spaces for community members to plant their own produce, and classrooms for teaching. Students also got the concrete experience of presenting their interventions to the director of the farm. This gave students the opportunity to learn what it's like to do a formal presentation to a key stakeholder in public health, as well as receive feedback for consideration based on the stakeholder's knowledge and experience in the field. This third, the, sorry, the third concrete experience 
Korean students got was to develop a community information pamphlet about Black Creek to distribute to the community. This was a task requested by the Partner for Students to do as an additional learning opportunity to understanding how the nonprofit works. In the second stage of reflective observation, students were able to fill their gaps in learning um, using what they had learned with the concrete learning experiences. In class, they learn about theories and models about public health issues and biology, but after getting a tour of the farm and hearing about food insecurity firsthand from a local stakeholder, they were able to apply what they learned to real world issues from a unique perspective and start to understand how food insecurity exists in the world. For the third stage of abstract conceptualization, students were able to modify concepts they already learned in class, develop their own ideas and theoretical constructs related to the WIL experience. They developed an understanding of how course concepts can be applied to understand food insecurity in Jane and Finch specifically to develop new models of addressing food insecurity. Finally, for the active experimentation stage, once they're exposed to the learning experience, students in the project found themselves able to develop innovative proposals for their interventions using what they had learned and presented to the community partner. Um, so we'll start off with the first lesson that we highlighted in the paper, which is that alignment of course learning outcomes with the aspiration of community partners can be challenging to achieve and requires careful dialogue. The development of the WIL experience was done with the course learning of outcomes in mind to ensure that it would enhance student learning rather than deter from the course materials. One of the main objectives students completed through the project was identifying strategies to prevent disease. And they did this by learning from the community partner about initiatives to tackle food insecurity. The other main objective they achieved was working in a team to complete a project about a global health issue and human biology. And so this project also aligned with the mission of Black Creek Community Farm, which is to inspire the next generation by providing leadership in food justice. Um, however, while the planned course project aligned with the course objectives and the mission of the community partner, there was an additional task the community partner created that didn't really align with the course objectives. It was requested that as part of the project, the students develop a four page summary and community pamphlet of the farm's achievements and programs to provide to the Toronto Food Policy Council and distribute to the community. While this was an interesting task, it didn't align with any of the course objectives or the project rubric. So it was difficult to assess how this activity would contribute to the students achieving the learning outcomes. And because this, deterred from the course objectives, it also um, affected the motivation of students to complete it. So WIL activities should be beneficial to both student learning and community partner needs. And this can be achieved in the future through ongoing partnerships between the institution and the community partner so that concrete goals benefiting both groups can be developed. Moving on to the second lesson we learned, um, this was that well-designed situated learning experiences enhanced critical thinking skills and course enjoyment. So students found that the WIL experience helped them think about course concepts and models beyond the classroom and apply critical thinking skills to understand how to apply it to a new context. They also found that the project um, helped them achieve the course learning outcomes and lightened an interest in future career and scholarly interests. Two students even remarked in the course evaluations um, saying that Black Creek Community Farm was an interesting experience and it was nice to learn about new health initiatives in Toronto. And another student saying that they really loved the project for this class and being part of the project really opened their eyes to the reality of globalization and how even though Toronto is considered one of the best places to live, um, there are still neighborhoods with children who don't have access to food. The third lesson that we learned was that because the situated learning experience is just part of the entire learning experience, careful consideration must be given to how much time students allocate to the experience. So the WEL project was completed by only 13 students, while the rest of the class completed the same project, but in a more hypothetical context without a community partner involved. So while the instructions and objectives of the project remained the same for both parties, the students participating in the WIL experience had to spend much more time outside of the classroom on their project than others did. This is because of things like traveling to the farm, which is quite far from U of T campus, as well as attending additional meetings with the community partner and completing that additional task of a four page um, summary and pamphlet, which was originally not in the project plan. Students also felt that their work, um, the work they were asked to do was a lot higher for other students. 
Lesson number four um, is that students may not see the value of such a situated learning experience unless they are clearly shown how such an experience might enhance performance in the course summative assessments. So this was the first WIL experience for many of the students who normally, normally have only had scholarly experiences that didn't really go beyond the classroom. So therefore, they may not have seen the value of components of the various activities involved in the project at first. For example, some students missed the original WIL activity of the farm tour and meeting with the director, which was understandable because of a student's busy schedule and the very far distance of the farm. However, more initiative could have been placed by the students at this stage to communicate with the partner um, via the other forms offered such as email or virtual call, since this was a very important step of collaborating with an organization. However, the value of each activity, such as the tour and the meetings, were seen when the students were actually developing their interventions, as they have clearly incorporated what they had learned from those experiences into their projects. Seeing the bigger picture at the end of the project can help increase the knowledge attained and stimulate learning. To increase students' interest earlier in the project for future projects, uh, learning outcomes can be listed specifically related to career development goals, such as engagement with partners. This could clearly define the project as a learning opportunity in which students can engage with partners to work on issues in public health. Such a learning outcome that could be implemented in future projects could be engaging with community leaders to create partnerships and develop career skills. And then finally, lesson number five is that creating hands-on experiences that stimulate work placements for students allows them the opportunity to create meaningful impact with the knowledge they learn. So, like I mentioned before, this culminating project for the Global Health and Human Biology course is usually done hypothetically and just presented to peers and a professor for evaluation. But with this WIL experience, students were given the opportunity to create an impact in the community by being able to develop real potential interventions that could be implemented into Jane and Finch, and these ideas were presented to the director of Black Creek. This provided potential impact for the Jane and Finch community as their interventions could be considered for funding and policy making. The four page summary the students created based on Black Creek's achievements was also impactful as it had been shared to the Toronto Food Policy Council and local organizations, allowing potential partnerships for Black Creek to continue addressing food insecurity. I also want to highlight um, one of our students, Selena, who continued to make an impact on the Jane and Finch community alongside Black Creek even after the course and WIL project was done. So she continued to advocate for food insecurity issues with Black Creek and even won the national award for CEWIL for her work in this WIL experience. She also received a COVID-19 student engagement award through which she supported Black Creek throughout during the pandemic with their emergency food box program. And finally, I'm just gonna quickly highlight some of the guidelines um, that we had developed based on the lessons we learned through this project. So the first one is that providing a variety of different opportunities to provide students with different methods of learning. The second guideline is that ideal community partners should have missions or values that align with the learning outcome to the course. The third guideline is that partnerships should be created in contexts where both academic and local community goals can be met. And the fourth guideline is that um, we must evaluate and refine learning outcomes with partners so that learning outcomes can be reciprocal and beneficial for both students and the community partner. And finally, WL experiences should be designed in line with the learning outcomes of the course. Um, I finally wanted to just do a quick acknowledgement um, about Black Creek Community Farm and the director, Leticia, who we want to thank um, for partnering up with our course and giving the students the opportunity for this work integrated learning experience. And that is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. And I will open the floor for any questions. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation, Apira. Um, for our next couple of minutes, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom page and we'll happily see how many we can get through in this window of time. As we wait for a few questions to go on the Q&A feature up here, I'm wondering, was there a reflection component to these well experiences that students or community engaged in either formally as part of the curriculum or informally just as part of say check-ins or something like that? 
Um, so there were two reflections. Um, so one was sort of formally in, integrated into the course. Um, so normally in Professor Obedina Azizika's courses, he always has a group evaluation component. So it's just a space for students to talk about the experience, say what they like, say what they didn't like. Um, so some of the points that we came across in our paper were based on like what we found out through that. And then the informal component is just the course evaluations that are part of U of T's courses. And they some students use that as an opportunity to talk about the experience with. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. We have a question in the chat um, from Carrie. Were there any skill development modules or lessons that accompanied your will experience? For example, something about professional communication. That's a great question. Um, so this was the first WIL experience we conducted with this course. Um, so there wasn't any specific skill development modules or lessons related to it because it was still very much related to the original project of just creating an intervention based on a global health case. But this is just more of a way to make the students more engaged in the community and providing the opportunity. But in the future, that is something we do wanna um, incorporate as a center of lessons, um, just like talk about career development skills and like learning how to engage with community partners. Um, so it's one of the lessons we learned for the future. Excellent, thank you. We have another question in the chat. Would you suggest any changes to the course delivery? That's also a great question. Um, I think the only change I would make is, so again, for one of the lessons, I talked about how some students, the WL students in particular, had to spend much more time on their projects compared to other students. So depending on the funding and like um, opportunities available in the future, um, I would just make the course more equitable so that all students are able to um, complete um, their objectives in similar fashions, um, as well as provide more WL opportunities so that more students can be involved rather than just a small group. Um, yeah. Excellent. Uh, we have time for one more question. And we have one in the chat. Were there some challenges with getting students engaged in the program? Did you find that taking more of a big picture approach resulted in hesitation or unsureness from the students in getting started with the project? Mm -hmm. I think um, in terms of the actual project of them developing an intervention, they were very engaged throughout the process um, because it was very clear the steps, but that one additional task of creating that four page summary for the nonprofit um, um, to help them create an impact, that was a little less motivating for students to do because it wasn't part of the original project or the syllabus. So in the future, I would just suggest that if there's anything um, additional being created, it should be laid out in the very beginning. But students did find that very beneficial towards the end because you know the Toronto Food Policy Council did take a look at it and like they were able to distribute it within the community. And it was like a skill they learned with knowledge translation to like make this information more accessible to the lay public. Um, so again, I would just suggest that if we are doing additional tasks, we need to make sure that they're basically highlighted at the beginning of the course so then students aren't demotivated by those types of things. Great, great advice and feedback. Thank you so much, Apira, for your excellent presentation. And thank you thank so you. much, everyone, for your great discussion and questions in the Q&A feature. Um, let's move us along to our next presentation. It's titled Number of Work Experiences and Student Employability by Drs. David, David Brewery and Jadine Preddy of the University of Waterloo. Waterloo. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Rachel. And um, a really nice follow-up, I think. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation, Apira, and I think that some of the things that, um, that Dave and I are going to highlight in our research connects really nicely uh, to some of the things that you found in your um, course-based uh, work integrated learning projects that students were involved in. Um, so I'm Judine Preddy. I'm here presenting today with my colleague Dave Jury, uh, both of us from the University of Waterloo. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say uh, to echo the comments of Ashley from the, the top of the, the session about how gratifying it is to see such a large turnout um, join in for this, this research session. I've been involved in well research for more than 10 years now, and uh, I'm really excited to see 
the momentum and the interest in will research in Canada. I hope that you will tune in to the other sessions that Ashley mentioned, and I'm looking forward to uh, to closing out the series uh, on March 3rd with uh, ways that you can get involved in will research if you aren't already. So what Dave and I are going to be sharing with you today, um, and thank you, Dave, for putting up the slides, is the contribution that we've made to the practice of co-op and work integrated learning in Canada con in the Canadian context book. Uh, we'll mention it again at the end of the presentation where you can learn more about this work if you're interested. But in addition to uh, reading the chapter in the book, uh, Dave was a guest uh, on, the ep on an episode for the Into the Wilderness podcast that Do uh, Dan Lagerin from Seawill um, produces. And uh, so that's another great discussion of the work that we're sharing today. So let's get started. So our chapter in the book focuses on the contribution of work integrated learning to student or graduate employability. So generally speaking, those of us who work in, in higher education know that um, it's fairly common for governments and educators, students, parents to be interested in how higher education is going to um, prepare students for their future of work, whatever that looks like. Um, and when we look across work integrated learning in Canada, um, as well as across the globe, it's clear that work integrated learning is seen as a mechanism or a model of education that has the opportunity to enhance graduate employability. There is some research that makes these connections. Uh, for example, there's research that demonstrates that participation in will programs reduces time from graduation to employment, as well as research that shows that there's a, a premium for wages for students who have participated in will. Uh, before I go further into our study, I want to note um, that while, while what we were studying was the connection between uh, participation in will and employability, um, I'm, we're not suggesting that employability is the only outcome of participating in work integrated learning. So I just want to be really clear that uh, while employability is an outcome of interest to many, we acknowledge that it's not, not the only outcome of interest. So with that, um, we've given the examples of wages and postgraduate employability as examples of outcomes for participating in will. But what we wanted to dig into is what is it about will that that's contributing to those outcomes. So uh, before I go further, let me say that when we say employability, for the purposes of this study, uh, we're talking about employers interest in hiring and retaining uh, a given individual for for employment. So the idea that that work integrated learning is connected to enhanced employability is not something that is surprising uh, for any of those working in the will field. Uh, we get to experience and see the growth of students in, in the day-to-day -day interactions that we have with them. But where we started was looking at the existing literature and we wanted to unpack what the link might be between work integrated learning and graduate employabilities. And one thing that stood out was the development of competencies. So because work integrated learning provides the opportunity for students to get experience in work related contexts, it gives them the opportunity to develop competencies and the development of those competencies then is contributing to students employability. So there's quite a bit in the, the literature to, to make that connection. And so, and just a note that when we're talking about competencies, we're talking about uh, knowledge or skills relevant in this case to work. So that's the first connection we made between employability and competency development. But when we looked at the literature, we wanted to take it one step further and examine what it is about the will experience that enables that competency development. And from the existing research, two things stood out. So one was the fact that students are engaging with authentic work, which ties really nicely to the presentation that Apira just, just gave. The other is the formalized reflection, which was also discussed in that presentation. So the formalized reflection that enables the students to examine and think about the experience and consider their areas for growth and development. So to recap, the literature suggests 
that the authentic nature of will experiences, the real world experience and the reflection are what is enabling students to contribute to their competency development. The act of working and reflecting helps students think about their professional interests, navigate social dynamics at work, and develop that tacit knowledge and skills that are going to be useful to them in subsequent experiences. So in turn, competency development then leads to graduate employability because employers are obviously seeking competent people. So intuitively, the more competent a person is, the more likely they are of value to an organization and the more likely the organization would be to extend an offer. So that's what we learned by examining the existing literature. One issue that seemed central to understanding the relationships between will, competency development and employability is the number of work experiences that a student participates in. What we, we know that will programs vary um, greatly. And one of the ways in which they vary is the number of experiences that a student might have through the course of the program. For the purposes of our work, we were most interested in the context of cooperative education programs. At Waterloo, where this research was conducted, uh, co-op students undertake between three and six work terms in completion of their undergraduate degree. Years ago, Pat Rowe, a um, well-known Will researcher, also from the University of Waterloo, suggested that the relative effects of these differing lengths of time is lacking in the research. And Pat reviewed um, or referred to a few different dimensions. So both the time within a given will experience, so is it a couple of weeks, is it four months, is it 16 months, as well as the, the number or the, um, the, the variation that might occur in terms of the difference, different work experiences. This, this um, backdrop is really what motivated us to explore the following question. Will participation in multiple work integrated learning experiences lead to greater competency development and in turn then greater employability? And so the study that we're sharing with you today explored these relationships, that is between the number of work, work experiences a co-op student had completed, a selected number of competency, uh, a selected indicators of competency development and employability that Dave is going to go into more details. And so with that, I will pass it over to you, Dave. Great, thanks, Judine. So that really sets up the motivation for the study and some of the background about how we were thinking about the relationships between the number of will work experiences and competency development, and ultimately how those things might translate into greater employability. So over the next few slides, I just want to give you a sense of how we tested some of these relationships and what we found in our results. So in terms of the method, we surveyed over 700 workplace supervisors who were all supervising uh, Waterloo co-op students. And we asked these people to report on a few different things. The first was the number of co-op work terms that the student had completed, which they know because that's a piece of information that's provided to them when students apply to the job. Then we asked them to evaluate one particular competency, which we thought might be important to understanding employability, which is called the lifelong learning mindset, something that we've been uh, at Waterloo focusing on over the last few years. Essentially what that thing is, is a mindset, uh, a collection of attitudes and beliefs and perspectives that thrust individuals toward learning for its own sake. You probably know someone like this in, in your personal life, someone who just seems to be curious and is exploring ideas all the time. And we use that as an indicator of competency development for two reasons. First, some of our research suggests that participation in work integrated learning contributes to it. So it's, it's actually something that can, uh, participation will can move the needle on that one thing. And also the greater the extent to which someone demonstrates that they're a lifelong learner um, is associated with benefits at work. Things like greater performance, greater success over the long term in one's career. So it seemed to be this intuitive way of thinking about competency development uh, that might bridge the gap between the experiences that students are having in work integrated learning programs and their employability outcomes. And finally, we asked supervisors a very straightforward question, which uh, to paraphrase was, given that there might be an opportunity for the student to join the organization, to what extent would you be willing to offer that student um, a position? And that's a really useful and simple and straightforward way of thinking about employability, 
because ultimately employability is something defined from the perspective of the employer. Using some linear regression based analyses, we explored the direct relationships between these three things. And we also really wanted to focus on the indirect relationship between number of will work experiences and employability that might be explained through the lifelong learning mindset. This is just a, a brief illustration, um, which you can find in our chapter of the ebook. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, I just want to scoot forward and uh, give you some of the highlights of our results. So we found that the number of will work experiences was positively associated with supervisors reports of students lifelong learning mindsets. That seems obvious. The more experiences that students completed, the more competent they were perceived to be by these supervisors. And we also found that supervisors reports of students lifelong learning mindsets were positively associated with supervisors willingness to offer their student a job in the future. The more competent the student was perceived to be, the greater their employability. And finally, we found that the number of will work experiences students completed was not directly related to supervisors' willingness to offer them a job, but it was indirectly related to it through competency development. In other words, the more experiences the students completed, the more competent their supervisor perceived them to be, and in turn, the greater their employability. So what does this all mean? Well, there's uh, a big caveat that Judine kind of hinted at earlier, which is that these results are situated in one WILL program, a co-op program at one university at Waterloo. And that particular co-op program is well established and has an impressive set of resources that it mobilizes to enhance competency development and employability. And we recognize that it's, uh, it has some nuances that might not be representative of all sorts of WILL programs. So we have to bear in mind that um, these results are exploratory and we don't know the extent to which they generalize elsewhere. Still, they, the results do seem to be consistent with will theory and they may help us understand the relationship between the number of experiences that students participate in and how those might translate to employability. We found that the more work experiences students completed, the greater their supervisor's rating of competency, which suggests that more exposure to will work experiences help students develop competency. So at least within the study of these supervisors, more experience seemed to benefit students' competency development. And as we expected, that competency development contributed to employability, which makes sense because as Judine said, employers want to recruit and retain competent people. And the more competent the students were perceived to be, at least in terms of their lifelong learning mindset, the more employable the supervisors uh, reported them to be. And perhaps most important of all, and I think this is the big takeaway, we found that there was no direct relationship between the number of experiences the students had and their employability. What seemed to be the critical link between these two concepts was competency development. And that's a really important takeaway because it suggests that offering more will experiences is not what we should be focusing on. What we should be focusing on is competency development. And it just so happens that within the context of this co-op program, more experience seem to be one way in which educators can think about contributing to competency development. But it's not the only way, and we need to think about what that might look like beyond co-op programs and other forms of will. So that's just a brief overview of uh, the highlights that we wanted to share with you today. We look forward to hearing from the audience and thinking about uh, what this might mean for your work. So thanks very much. Yes, thank you both for that excellent presentation. Um, once again, to our attendees, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to put your questions in and I'll catch them. Uh, as we're waiting for people to type in the questions that they have for you, uh, Judine and David, I would love to hear about, based on what you've learned, how has this changed the way you think about students entering a Will program or Will experience for the very first time? Are you focusing on, um, this is a brave new step, an exciting new step, have that growth and learning oriented mindset or anything else that makes you think back to those that are just starting out. Do you wanna start with that one, Dave? Sure, I mean, you mentioned, Rachel, thanks for that question. You mentioned the lifelong learning mindset, which is a concept I'm really interested in. Um, it's something that the UN was talking about 50 years ago. They said, you know what? I think the role of higher education is to develop students into lifelong learners, the sort of people who can develop their competencies over time. And what this study shows and what some of the other recent studies that Judine and I have worked on also show 
is that, yeah, developing students into lifelong learners seems to have some benefit um, in the long run. We've found that it's associated with things like workplace performance. It might even be associated with their satisfaction with their work. And it might even have implications for long-term career success, like the number of promotions they receive um, over the course of several years working in, in a professional role. Um, so yeah, that, that's something that has me thinking about the role of work integrated learning and in, in competency development and how it seems to be a really powerful way, not just to train students on specific tacit skills and knowledge, but to really fundamentally transform them into people who think about how um, kind of like the bigger picture of the learning process and how they should develop this mindset that it inspires them to continue learning. So again, I, I really think that work integrated learning is a powerful way to demonstrate that to students. And like Judy alluded to, it seems to have something to do with the exposure to authentic workplaces and the opportunity to reflect, which is often a critical component of WILL programs. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Dave. And I think the, the one thing that I might add to that is that there's, there's a challenge and a tension in, in terms of preparing students and, and coaching students through work integrated learning experiences in the, you know, so many things to um, prepare them for, to ensure they're ready for, um, and how, how do you sort of cover the full spectrum from workplace health and safety to their um, their rights to all of those things. And at the same time, I couldn't help but be struck by the previous presentation around um, students who had the option to do the will, um, real experience or the, the um, authentic but constructed experience. And, and I wonder how much, um, how we balance the, the practical needs of supporting and, and preparing students with the idea of, of this bigger picture of what, what, develop, what were those students developing through those interactions that potentially the in-class students didn't get, didn't get that experience with um, and, and how to highlight for students that that, that growth is what's going to, um, to sort of benefit them going forward. So the advantage that multiple programs that have multiple experiences is there's, there's more time to scaffold um, those, those reflections and those conversations moving from more the, this is your first work professional workplace experience to, um, let's think about this more deeply. Let's think about the things that you're learning and taking away from it. So it's definitely a challenge from a, from a program design perspective, especially getting started. Awesome. Thank you both. Uh, we have quite a few questions showing up in the Q and A and in the chat. Um, first off, Barney is wondering, how did you measure lifelong learning competencies? Yeah, thanks, Barney. For this study, there's a few different ways we've done it in the past. For this study, we were building on um, a project that was ongoing at the University of Waterloo about the construction of something we're calling the Future Ready Talent Framework, this tool for thinking about the talents that are important in the future of work. The lifelong learning mindset is a component of that. And so we had just gone through this exercise working with will stakeholders to identify behaviors that represent that sort of competency. So fresh off the press, we just had the, these list of sentences that employers thought represented someone who is a lifelong learner at work. And all we did was write those as uh, statements to which they could agree or disagree with. And there were six of them. Uh, we can share examples, or if you have access to the ebook, you can find them in the table in the chapter. So they read each of those sentences and just said, to what extent do you agree that your student demonstrated these sorts of behaviors at work? And then at the end of that, you compile them all together. And the higher the score, the, the greater the extent um, we would say the student demonstrated that they were a lifelong learner. Thank you. And as our next question, Amelia is wondering, what is the relationship of your co-op program to a regulatory body or an accreditation body and how does that influence competency development? That's a great question. Do you want me to start that one, Dave? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, so the, so a couple of things. So one, we are, uh, Waterloo's co-op programs are accredited through CWILS. Um, co-op accreditation process, which involves a number of dimensions uh, demonstrating how students are learning during the work term. So that's how our programs in general are accredited. But then there's an additional layer, which is um, 
the professional programs that have co-op as a component. So I can think of um, three off the top of my head. So our engineering program is mandatory co-op as is our accounting and financial management as is our school of planning. And so in those cases, they are using data um, from the co-op assessments uh, in terms of employers evaluation of the student's competency in a variety of ways, they are using that as input to their, their professional accreditation associations. I, I think that answers your question. If it doesn't feel free to. Um, Can I just add one thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just for clarification. So we mentioned that we super, sorry, that we surveyed over 700 supervisors and you might get the impression that they all came from a particular discipline like engineering. They didn't, they came from a whole smattering and there's like, I don't know how many programs are at Waterloo, like 170, right? And almost all of them have co-op. So our data set represents a whole wide range of people. They could be psychology students, engineers, public health students. There's a whole bunch of people who might be represented um, by what we found here. Great point. Thanks, Steve. Uh, as our next question, Tim is asking, was the duration of the will experience considered? Good, good question, Tim. I think, um, I think that's an area for future research. So we mentioned Pat Rowe's um, model for exploring the work in work integrated learning and saying that time is a, is a critical dimension and that means the number of experiences, but also the, the length of a given experience. We have a fairly um, consistent model at Waterloo where students are in the workplace between 12 and 16 weeks. Um, most of them being the four week, four month, 16 week model. So there wasn't variation um, from that perspective in this, in this study. Great, moving towards the questions in the chat, Ashley is wondering, is it possible that students focus more on competency development when they know they will complete multiple will experiences versus engaging in one authentic work experience? At the, end of the, at the end of a degree when they may personally be approaching the experience to get hired as opposed to for learning purposes. Any suggestions to help students focus on competency, competency development in will? That's a great question, Ashley. Um, and it is something that actually came up a little bit in the conversation that Dave had with Dan on the podcast in regards to there's there's other factors that obviously could be affecting the the development of of these competencies and we would need um, more um, a different design to be able to isolate the impact of will itself. But with respect to um, like a, a one later experience versus several, I there we don't have research to to answer that. I I think that it has to do with how the, how the design of the program is, is structured to incorporate that reflection on the authentic um, meaningful tasks as opposed to um, the fact that it's one versus many. But I don't know, Dave, if you have um, a hypothesis on that. I definitely don't have a hypothesis. It's a really interesting question to consider. Um, Ashley used the word focus on, like, like suggesting that students are paying attention to competency development. I'm not even sure that's the case. And I don't even know if that's a critical factor in the learning process within Will. I don't know that they need to know at the beginning, okay, I'm here to develop competencies. I think it's um, probably even something that they take for granted that Will experiences are just so um, abundant with learning opportunities. I don't even know that they know until the end. Um, and what we've I think what the literature really highlights within that process is the power of reflection, critical reflection, reflection on experience, re reflection in experience, which everyone on this call knows all too well, and I don't need to explain it, but um, I think that's the critical point at which students start to focus on their competency development. So in will programs, as we offer more of those opportunities in very intentional ways, like really start to highlight them as important parts and not just something that they do for a pass credit at the end of uh, you know, a one week thing that they just kind of scribble down something in an hour and call it done. If we really sort of put that up on a pedestal and say, this is an important thing, we need to focus on this. I think we'll find that students take competency development more, more seriously and they'll actually develop competencies to a greater extent through that process. Thank you both. We have one last question. 
which is, did you compare firm employment offers and your lifelong learning variable? Well, like another way of operationalizing employment. I'm sure that's what that question means. Um, so the answer is no, we didn't. It was a really straightforward question because the project was situated within the co-op work term. And I can't remember exactly when we sent out the survey, but it would have been towards the end. And you can imagine after four months working with someone, you get a pretty good idea of whether you want them to stick around. So it, it made sense to just ask kind of straight up, to what extent would you be willing to have this person stick around? Um, we didn't follow that up with a measure of whether that student came back. And that's a really interesting next step. I mean, if you wanna think about intention behavior links, intention behavior across various domains are usually pretty strong but the environment intervenes in that relationship. For instance, the supervisor could have said, I want this student back. And then perhaps COVID happened and the dynamics of the organization changed in a way that made it you know, untenable for that student to stick around. So um, maybe in a future study, we can think about what that link looks like, but you can imagine that the more willing they were, were to have the student stick around, um, the more likely it was that at least an offer was sent out. The, the other um, challenging component to that is often uh, Waterloo students in particular are part of the co-op program because they want to try out different employers over the course of their employment. And so whether or not the student returns may not correspond to whether or not the employer wanted them to, to return. And so when we were wanting to get at this, uh, this idea of employability, it was more a matter of would you extend an offer? Right. Alrighty, thank you both and thank you uh, to all of our present uh, presenters and speakers today. Uh, we have one minute left, so I will close with just giving like a virtual applause to everyone. Thank you so much again for sharing your fantastic work. Um, once again, the papers that these presentations are based on can be found on the ebook. Um, the link is posted a couple of times in the chat. Um, and I invite everyone to join us next week for part two, where we'll learn about Will in the Ontario college sector and addressing common barriers to engaging faculty in work integrated learning. Uh, so with that, thank you so much everyone and take care and stay safe.